Between the years of 2013 and 2035, many events brought about the worst in humanity and the destruction of the world as we know it. Amazingly, however, the world continues to work through it in much different circumstances. Down in the metros of Moscow, thousands of people would continue to live avoiding the horrors of the post-apocalyptic world above them, trying to keep the power operational, feed everyone around them, and develop communities to allow them to feel like they are going back to a sense of normality. This, however, would only bring about those old human habits that put them in this position in the first place, bringing about war, hatred, crimes, and once again, the worst human traits. For over 20 years, this would be life within the metro. But what were the full events that took place over those years? What decisions shaped the metro's future and what characters stood out amongst others? Well, in today's video, we will be looking at the full timeline from the metro games and books, looking at all the factions from the world, all of the notable moments and eventually how Archium and his gang of Spartans made it to their green world. Also just before we begin I do not speak Russian at all and I've tried my best at the pronunciations so if I do get some wrong I do apologize but hopefully they're not that bad. So strap in, pour yourself some mushroom vodka and grab a bag of heavily preserved metro pork as this is going to be a long one. This is the full story and timeline from the metro series. Our story begins with one individual, one Artyom Alexeyevich Chornich, who was officially born on the 11th of January 2009, four years before the world would see destruction on a scale never witnessed before. While some believed he was born in 2013, as it was stated once that he had turned 20 in 2033, this could not be so as Artyom has rough memories later in his life of what it was like up on the surface before the war. He could remember his mother or at least her presence, and due to some other timeline events that happened later on, he would have had to have been at least four by the time of the war, otherwise he would not have comprehended what happened to him in 2015, otherwise he would have only been two. But officially, breaking the immersion for a second, on the Metro website, Artyom is listed as being born a few years before the Great War, which implies his birth date of the 11th of January 2009 is correct, and by the time of the Great War, he was around four years old. Not much is known about how he was brought up on the surface, but what was known was that his mother was extremely caring about him and seemed to be an only child with no father. For around four years, life would be good for the people of Moscow and for Archon. The world was full of color, children would play in the playgrounds, and it seemed like nothing could change their precious world. That was until 2013 came about. Whilst Russia continued on its regular way of life within the 2010s, they would be keeping a close eye out on the Middle East, where tensions were reaching a boiling point. For unknown reasons, but most likely due to resources or strong ideology differences, Iran or Iraq found themselves in a heated exchange with either Lebanon or Israel. At first this conflict would be small and very limited, with only small battles happening over the different countries. However, as these exchanges took place, other nations got involved believing that they were in the danger zone from these countries. This was made clear that things were not to be taken lightly, as the Middle Eastern countries who were originally went to war, launched their nuclear missiles at each other with the attempt to take them off the map completely. With this happening, the surrounding nations had to therefore take further action to ensure their own survival and also retaliate due to treaties with one another, and with that also launch their nuclear warheads. By this point, a domino effect took place and multiple nations all over the Middle East to Europe and Asia started launching their own missiles, forcing the world into the Great War. The biggest global conflict the world had ever seen, and probably the last of this scale it will ever see again. Over in the Ural Mountains, word had spread extremely quickly about the conflict happening within the Middle East, and planning started to take place to make sure the Russian government was safe if Moscow or any of the capital cities were to be bombed out. This triggered the planning and development of the bunker that would be located within the mountains themselves, and would go on to be named the Ark. As construction went ahead, Russia was being targeted by the NATO 
forces who became aware of the Ark's construction and would become a fundamental target for them to take out. Because in NATO's eyes, if they took out the Ark, they would have completely destroyed the Russian government and would hopefully lead them to surrender. But little did they know the Ark was far from finished. Whilst it had taken on board quite a few resources but not nearly enough as they had wanted and constructed a fully functioning communication antenna, only the construction workers and high-ranking soldiers, including a single doctor, were located there, with the government not arriving at all. When the bombs eventually came to Russia, the Ark, as mentioned, was a fundamental target and the area was hit twice as hard as Moscow was, simply because of the idea that the government was housed there. Amazingly, most of the Ark survived, but they were now trapped away from the rest of the world, forced to live off their limited supplies of food and water, and forced to repair the communications array to try and seek help. Things weren't much better for the residents of Novosibirsk before the bombs fell either. Before the conflict started, the government took action here to make sure it was prepared for when the conflict reached its peak. With this, the government assigned a military unit known as OSCOM to command the city in the lead up to the war as well as after it had finished, whatever the outcome may be. For a while, people were uneasy about OSCOM's involvement, making them feel like they were suddenly prisoners within their own city. But this got even worse the closer they got to the bombs falling, as OSCOM OSCOM's control got more aggressive. With the rise in aggression and the sheer panic from the people of the city, riots started to take place as the military tried to control everything. One location within Novosibirsk became fundamental during this time, and that was the scientific research lab known as the Institute. Knowing full well that Russia was going to be hit by nuclear bombs, this lab would start developing a new drug that would be life-changing for those who stayed within the city. This drug would have a few names, Radio Protector or Zelenka, or its English English translation, green stuff. This drug would be incredibly powerful as it resists heavy radiation and when the bombs did fall, the people would be able to survive the surrounding area's radiation long enough for it to eventually die down and be livable again. But they just had to produce enough before the bombs came. On top of that, they would also make the drug known as Renegan F, which would be a groundbreaking cure for gas poisoning and other types of poisons out there, which again would be fundamental to humanity's survival for after after this great war. That's not to say that this institute was a beacon of hope. They also had a dark side to them, as they would actively develop biological weapons to hit back against their enemies and would use bases across the Volga to store all of the deadly chemicals and poisons that were being developed there. This would also go on to create a terrifying and deadly creature that would go on to be revealed in the later years. One that would go on to be the only creature to live up on the surface in the year of 2035. These institutes Institute experiments were not secret, however, as NATO knew exactly what they were up to, and once again this whole city became a major target to take out to ensure their own safety. As the war heated up, so too did the riots, eventually taking place outside of the metro stations, with many citizens panicking trying desperately to pour into them for safety. This got so bad that OSCOM took action and would send in tanks to try and calm the situation. But when that caused even more panic, they were going to fire a sabot round into a nearby metro station to stop people going in in their masses. This could not have been timed any worse as seconds later missiles entered the city's airspace, but these were no regular nuclear missiles. These were the more destructive weapons humanity had to offer. These were Colbert bombs, which would explode in the air and coat the city in mass radiation, eight times more deadly than what Moscow was hit with, meaning the whole surface was coated in white snow and was unlivable and almost impossible to venture over unless injected with a good amount of anti-rad green stuff. Whilst Moscow wasn't as affected as Novosibirsk, the bombs flying over there also caused mass panic again, forcing thousands into the metros with the military struggling to control who went in eventually shutting the doors and leaving many to be wiped out by the pure destruction and turned to dust. For one individual, they would find themselves trapped within a currency exchange booth in the days leading up to the bomb fall out on Moscow. Between around July 8th to around July 15th, this lady would document herself losing her mind as she had been refused access to the metro station. But July 14th, she had tragically lost the will to live and quotes, I don't want this anymore. I don't want this anymore. Bury me with dignity and not in this infernal kiosk. I'm suffocating. Thanks for Nazipam. Good night. 
On the following day, the currency exchange booth survivor ended her life and her suffering, leaving her diary entries out within the world for anyone to read what it was like in her last few days on this earth. For one plane labeled Flight 76715 that was heading back from Mallorca, Spain, they would go on to arrive at the worst possible time as they were scheduled to land at the international airport within Moscow. With no one expecting the bombs to be coming this early, this flight's cockpit got front row seats seats of the bombs entering the airspace. For these holiday goers coming back from their travels and pilot Tolia and co-pilot Andre, they would be helpless in this instant as their plane would be hit by an electromagnetic pulse wave from the missiles, causing them to have no control on the plane as all of their engines had gone. Desperate to save the plane and their lives, Tolia would try to contact anyone down on the surface to help them, but it was no good. Their lives were coming to an end. As the plane hurtled down through the red missile filled skies, the young Andre would cry out for help saying, I don't want to die. Moments later, it was over and the plane crashed into the nearby metro station, killing everyone inside. By mid-July, the Great War or World War III was officially over and for Russia, they had lost dramatically with reports stating they had lost between 139 million and 140 million people, with only 6 to 7 million people surviving down within the metros and outside in the countryside area areas that hadn't been hit nearly as much. Russia did, however, retaliate utilizing their nuclear submarines in an act called the Dead Hand Contingency, but not as much damage was caused as many just simply stood down due to moral concerns or lack of new targets. In the end, the world was completely devastated with almost every nation being hit. It was reported, however, that for parts of Central America, parts of Europe, Africa, and other smaller countries, they would survive the nuclear war and continue to live on but in much different conditions now that the world's environment was changing due to the punishment it had just taken. The planet transformed into a toxic dust bowl. Irradiated material began circulating around the globe and started blocking out the sun. Plant and animal life suffered massively due to no sunlight and the food chain suffered greatly because of it, with a lot of animals mutating heavily into new creatures that could survive these horrific conditions. For humans, however, the new atmosphere on the surface was completely completely unlivable for the first few years, and even 20 years on is still unlivable, especially within Novosibirsk. But other things were happening throughout the lands. In late 2013, going into 2014, a new phenomenon was happening down within the metros and on the surface. Ghosts or shadowy figures started appearing within unlived parts of the metro or within heavily populated areas, almost like a last remaining part of their soul remained on the world. How they came to be is unknown but they are hostile if you were to linger for too long or listen into their cries throughout the pipes of the abandoned metro stations. To the ghosts, however, they do not realize that they are indeed dead and still cry out for loved ones or get confused as to where they are. One ghost remnant of a train, for example, is seen to crash over and over again, forcing those that were on it to relive that memory over and over again for eternity. One of the most horrifying things anyone could imagine. These new supernatural phenomenons would appear all over the metro and on the surface during this time, and things such as the River of Fate would become something only a rare few would find and witness its abilities, whereas places like the Great Door would be housed with evil spirits trying to kill anyone who found it, or turn them utterly insane. At this same time, the first mutants would make their appearances, these being the Nosilises, who would actively search for a new food source, and would raid the human metro stations killing anyone in their way to then eat, giving the newly refued humans a new threat that they had to now deal with, whilst also processing everything they had just lost up on the surface. The worst thing that happened in this year, just after the world had met its destruction, was within the Kremlin and D6 bunker, where past experiments had started mutating thanks to the radiation and not being kept in check. This led to the forming and growth of a new creature that would linger there, taking in any body that it could be that man or animal, forming the horrific looking biomass that would not be discovered for many years, only allowing it to grow more and more. But now that the world was changing dramatically, humanity had to now evolve and adapt to its new surroundings. Going into the mid to late 2010s, a lot would change as it would finally see the rebuilding of society and the development of new political parties. around 
around 2014 or 2015 and for the humans of the metro they were somewhat safe in their own new little homes. However resources were not as great as many would have hoped, mainly because the war arrived sooner than anyone expected. Something needed to be done. They could not grow traditional food sources and animal life was limited down within the stations. This forced the communities to come up with a new role. A group of individuals who were brave and strong enough to go up onto the surface to scrounge for resources that included weaponry, medicine and anything else that would be useful to them and bring them back for their societies to help them prosper best they could. This group would be labelled as the Stalkers and during 2014 and 15 the first of them was sent up onto the surface to scout the world around them and see the destruction that was caused and grab any resources they could find, establishing them fully as their own unique group. As more and more people went up to the surface as part of the Stalker missions, the regular citizens of the Metro realised they needed to arm themselves from the mutants and anything else out there trying to kill them. Unfortunately, many weapons were destroyed within the war and military officials would still keep hold of the vital ones, including the munitions they came with. This forced the others to come up with a new solution, to make most of the scrap metal they housed and old gun parts they had salvaged on their travels. This allowed skilled craftsmen and women to start making their own unique Metro guns during this time, as well as their own unique ammunition that was proudly advertised as made in the Metro. These weapons included the Tiha, the Bastard and the Brilliant Shambler, which all became massively popular throughout all of the inhabited stations throughout the many years and allowed the citizens to be fully armed for whenever they were ever under attack from mutants or crazed individuals looking to harm others. During this time when all of this was going on, the Metro was under the rule of one group that was named the Metro Central Command or United Administration, essentially the original Russian government or close aides to them, along with high-ranking officials and policemen who had survived the war and housed itself down in the heart of the Metro lines. Everything that happened within the Metro was done by their rule and they set the laws for this new society. For a lot of people, however, they did not think that the Metro Central Command consisted of the original government, including the president, as they believed they had been escorted to the Ark out within the Ural Mountains and one day they would return to give them guidance and bring them back to the surface to repopulate the Earth and start rebuilding again. One day, however, people started to clock that no rescue was coming and the surface was far too irradiated to ever be lived on again, most likely thanks to the stalkers who were going up on a regular basis. The lie and the morale boost the Metro Central Command had told the people was evident and because of this realisation, their rule came crumbling down and the once unified Metro that had been set up for the first year or so now turned into individual Metro station cities that had their own unique identities. Some of the Metro Central Command lived on though and would continue to manipulate things from within the shadows and from within D6. With this command shut down however this caused problems. Some people didn't agree with the rules of their select cities and some were being banished from others. This caused some individuals to try and live on their own and take from those they despised or generally take for the fun of it and thus brought about the first formation of bandit groups who would steal and kill from the weak and unfortunate. These weren't the only factions to form however as immediately with the collapse of the central command some political parties started rising to power within their parts of the metro and influencing their ideas on the people around them. These parties consisted of the Watchtower, a group of Jehovah's Witnesses who set up within their own subway train which they had converted into a monastery. Believing that the end times were upon them, they were adamant that the survivors of the Great War were those selected by God himself to ascend to heaven. Whilst not exactly the most dangerous of factions, they certainly are very active in the area they live and for many they are sceptical about their ambitions and get annoyed by their presence and constant preaching wherever they go. The Hansa. Based within the ring line, this group realised they were part of an essential line that connected to everyone else and was vital for trade routes. Immediately on the fall of the central command, the real name of the faction, the Commonwealth, officially set up and used this opportunity to become the main hub for traders, allowing them to become the richest faction out there, making others extremely jealous of what they had. Now called the Hansa by everyone around the metro stations, they would be regarded as one of the superpowers 
sellers out there who provided the best trade services. However, to many, this would be a problem as they would be overwhelmed by envy and would want to take it from them at some point. The Arbat Confederation Like the hands of the Arbat Confederation was set up as another group of traders who held the ideals of a capitalist autocracy run by immigrants from the Caucasus, non-Russian nationality traders and their descendants. Like the hands of this group would hold immense power down in the metros and would be the envy of many others. But as the years went on their power would eventually fade thanks to the same group that wanted to get a piece of their pie. The Red Line. This group of Reds would idolize the old Russian ways of Stalin and the Soviet state. When the bombs fell and people went into the metro stations, a few individuals who were passionate about their country's history would be drawn to the station of Sokolnitskaya and embrace the luxury made by the Soviet state back in the day and saw this as an opportunity to bring it back into existence and with that set up their communist utopia. Setting up there, many pilgrims would venture there after the collapse of the central command and began building the socialist dream into stations such as Sokol. With the central command now gone, the new communist faction started their expansion and overthrew everyone on the red line, setting up their revolutionary councils. With many stations taken over, their new goal was formed and that was to spread true communism throughout all of the metro and keep it for all time. But with that goal meant a lot of resistance and hatred towards the more capitalist factions such as the Arbat Confederation. Federation and the Hansa, as well as other more right-wing factions. The Fourth Reich. On the other side of the spectrum was the ultra right wing faction who would be inspired by the ideology of the Russian National Unity Party formed before the war. This group would suddenly spring up out of nowhere after the command failed and began populating the station of Pushkinskaya with slogans such as the Metro is for Russians and do a good deed, clean up the Metro. This would lead to the deaths of many non Russians who they would wipe out in their masses and would continue continue branching out further into Chekhovskaya and Tverskaya, establishing the modern Reich. Obviously, their expansion brought about awareness to them, which quickly gained them many enemies who felt what they were doing was utterly barbaric and totally unethical. But to them, they just see it as a way to move forward into a new, better world. The Savage Cannibals of the Great Worm Cult Another absolutely terrifying group that set up after the collapse of the Central Command was the group known as the Great Worm Cult, who would start occupying the station known as Park Bobity. Originally, this group was just survivors who were located near the Kremlin who sought this area as their new home. Believing they were safe when the bombs came, they quickly realized this station was a mistake as a huge cave-in happened, separating them from everyone else. For this group, they would be stuck in the dark with limited resources and no communication. And for everyone else, they all thought the station was completely abandoned, so there was no point going into it. Trapped on their own for a few years drove the individuals mad, and they started to develop their own unique religion, worshipping the Great Worm, which supposedly burrowed throughout the metro tunnels and created humans from its stomach. Its purpose was to travel down to the center of the earth and return in a millennium. This made the cult super religious and also extremely technophobic and xenophobic, believing that everyone else were people of machines, essentially their enemies that were fit for only one purpose, and that was cannibalization. Luckily, many would not know of their existence in the early years, but occasionally they would jump out of the darkness and grab children from nearby stations to start up the new generation of members, brainwashing them into believing the great worm god and to kill those who did not believe, something that would happen for just under under two decades. The Satanists. Out within the station of Tamir Yazevskaya, the group known as the Satanists would start up their worship of the new world. Believing that the end of the world had indeed happened and the Moscow Metro was the gate to the underworld and they just needed to go a bit deeper to find it. Not much is known about how the cult was set up. However, it is explained that their higher up members would control their members through the use of hallucinogenic mushrooms, be that in a drink or within their food. Under the leadership of Sharon since 2014, 
14. This cult now coats its station in pentagrams everywhere they can, as well as other satanic imagery with the real goal of finding hell, capturing and torturing anyone they come into contact with in the most inhumane ways possible. Slaving, killing, torturing, you name it, this cult will do it, and in the most barbaric way possible, with the hope that one day they will reach hell and be rewarded for it. Out within the Ark, the workers and soldiers were not faring well by this point in the timeline. With resources running extremely low, they were all becoming extremely desperate. However, they had just fixed the radio antenna so it could finally reach out to others and ask for help. But now with most of the residents going insane and so desperate turning them quite aggressive, they instead used it to lure people in, disguising themselves as the true government. One officer did try to stop them at the time but was quickly killed by all of those around him. When luring these people in from outside, these insane workers would deliver the bodies to their now leader, the doctor, who would carefully prepare the edible meat from their bodies to serve up to their community. This worked as their new food resource and kept them going. However, the side effects were horrific as most would lose all sense of speech, only being able to say single words such as meat or grunting, and on top of that would become extremely hostile to anyone that got in their way, devolving them into primitive beings. Now with their plan working, the doctor and his intelligent members would continue sending the signal out, pretending to be the government and luring individuals in for years to come. Out a bit further within the once Caspian Sea area, now known as the Caspian Desert, a group of once Farag oil workers, ex-soldiers and mobsters would move into the area with their fully operational vehicles. Because of how technologically advanced they were compared to the others in their travels, when they got to the Caspian region, they would go on to easily enslave the local population and take out all of the other raider groups to become the dominant force within the whole area, as they were going to set up guard posts and establish their heavily guarded headquarters. With this new land, they would continue enslaving individuals to do their work for them, developing their advanced weaponry and technology, and just making sure their faction of the Manai Bela were the ones to fear, and their leader, the Baron, was the ruler of this land now. In Kazakhstan, however, However, a small group of small kids would finally develop into their own faction known as the Children of the Forest. Originally just on a scout trip to the forest, these kids would be under the guidance of their teacher until the bombs fell and suddenly trapped them with nowhere to go back to. For a while, the teacher kept them safe and taught them all of the life skills they needed to survive out within the forest, from salvaging to creating fires, hunting and basic weapon making, and even set up their own justice system. But then one day, the teacher became aware that he was being seen to the children as a prophet, and they followed his every word. Seeing that they were fully capable of fighting off danger and surviving, the teacher would consider leaving them, but stayed to watch them develop a little bit more. After a group of boys from their group took matters into their own hands and killed a group of bandits without consulting anyone, the teacher had become disgusted at the way they had turned out and officially called them all monsters, which would go on to damage this faction even further, separating them into two groups, the Pioneers and the Pirates, who were seen as the more barbaric ones whilst the teacher moved to an abandoned church. Sadly for the teacher, after seeing what he had turned them into during the year of 2014 and 15, took his own life, leaving behind his messages that the children now interpreted in two different ways. With the teacher's death, they would go on to build a shrine for him, and in the years to come would continue on fighting their own wars and scavenging for any and all resources. A bit closer to the metro out within the Volga, an ex-political figure and possibly ex-mental asylum patient called Silantius would travel into the area and would immediately start preaching to the locals about how he knew how to stop the deadly paranormal anomalies that were hurting people there. This was done through the use of charms, which was actually just lightning rods that would destroy the electrical-based anomalies. To further this, Silantius would encourage everyone to stop using Using all electrical technology as that only empowers the beings further. And after proving himself a few times, Salantius finally was able to amass a loyal following from the locals. With him now having the locals of the area following his every word, their society would go on to be completely technology free and would set themselves up within the church on the lake. Here they would worship the giant fish in the lakes near them called the Water Czar, which would help them create the name of their new faction, the Church of the Water Czar. 
Over in both the Institute in Novosibirsk and the abandoned parts of the D6 bunker, the once creatures being experimented on back before the war had broken free and were seeking a new life out on the surface. During this time, most likely in late 2014, early 2015, both the Dark Ones and the Blind Ones would break out from where they were once housed and started living out on the surface, building up their new homes and trying to understand the new world around them. It truly was a new era for the world. New species were becoming dominant on the surface, humanity were going back into almost tribal groups, and essentially everyone was adapting to this new way of life in this post-apocalyptic world. For Artyom, however, he would go on to witness a horror that no one else should ever have to witness. In the later half of 2014 and early 2015, Artyom and his mother would live in Tamiryazevskaya. For a time, this was perfect for everyone living there. It had resources, security, and it was a friendly station. But little did the residents know that it was located right next to a huge rat's nest and sadly for this station one day those rats got hungry and ventured into the station attacking everyone in their way. With very little time to act Archiom's mother was attacked by the rats and taken off to be savaged by them. In her last attempt to save her child she would ask a fellow member of the station a soldier at the time Alex Sukhoi to look after Archiom and take him to safety. With not much choice Alex agreed and took Archiom away from the danger escaping the station by a rail car, leaving behind everyone else to die from the rats. The two eventually made it to the VDNKH area and started living within Exhibition, where Alex would become Artyom's adopted father, but never went by the name father, instead always referred to as uncle by Artyom. Life for Artyom and Alex here was far better than before as Alex was an extremely caring man to Artyom, as he wanted to be a good role model for him and ultimately a good father figure. During their time here, Artyom would make friends with two other boys named Vitaly and Eugene, who would regularly go off into the nearby tunnels for their own games and to just explore. However, in 2015, this group went a bit further than usual, traveling out into the neighboring botanical garden station, which was completely abandoned. When getting there, this group found a rusted escalator that took them up to the surface. Without hesitation, the boys all traveled up it and discovered the seal hermetic door. Archum looking around the area found the control for it and opened it, wondering what was on the other side. To their amazement, the door opening revealed the sky, something that was so breathtaking to all of them. However, this was broken almost immediately as the scream came from a nearby ruin and multiple watchmen turned up to attack the three boys. Vitaly and Eugene immediately ran back into the metro to get to safety, leaving Archim on his own. But before the watchmen could attack, a dark one appeared in front of the young boy and scared them away. Here the dark one and Archim would share a unique bond that had never been made before. The Dark Ones would allow Artyom to be mentally protected all of his life, but as a consequence he would forget this encounter completely as well as his whole past, and as a result of that would leave the hermetic door open for years on end, allowing anything to enter into the metro whenever it wanted to in the later years. Out within the station of Polyanka, they too would also face a horrific event where a ton of Nosilises would go on to invade the station and kill anyone they could get their hands on. Defenders leaped into action taking out as many as they could which included a young man known as Khan. Eventually it would become too much for everyone and a young Khan would end up getting wounded after blowing up the airlock of the station. Immediately after this Khan would have no choice left and would force close the gate on all of his friends to make sure the Nosilises would not escape further into the metro. However this event would mean everyone inside was killed and Khan was left on his own, left to suffer with the guilt of what he had done for years to come. During this same time within 2015, tension was heating up within the circle line as the Hansa met the Red Line and the Communist forces. With the Reds trying to get people on board with their ideals, the Hansa had other ideas and wanted to unite the northern and southern arcs of its territory that was currently split by the Red Line. Here the Hansa started arresting speakers and agitators of the Red Line, which did not go down well at all with the Reds' command. A full Red Line force was assembled and sent in to take over the surrounding stations, with the commanders believing it would be an easy task. This was very wrong, as the Hansa now had the help from the Arbat Confederation and together formed into the anti-communist coalition. All the forces started attacking each other by this point, but it was no good. For a year and a half, the two were at a constant stalemate, with both sides going on to commit atrocities along the way, such as using flamethrowers on captured 
prisoners and civilians from either side. As resources started getting lower and lower for both of the forces, the communists turned away from their grand plan of spreading communism throughout all of the metro and instead looked at taking over Revolution Square from the coalition as it held important communist purpose and significance such as the Lenin Mausoleum. This battle became one of the bloodiest during the whole war and one where it saw true bravery with some soldiers taking multiple bullets to the chest just to continue fighting and complete their missions. In the end, the fighting was once again a stalemate and it was quite clear that this war was going on for far too long with no clear ending in sight. Eventually, after a few years of brutal warfare, both sides had become tired and had lost too many people, either in combat or by desertion. For the Hansa and Arbat, they had also lost a ton of trades during this time and needed to get back on top of it if they were to continue to exist. Eventually, at a neutral station, Comrade Moskvin from the Reds, Prime Minister Rusakov of Hansa, and head of the Arbat Confederation, Kolpikov, signed a peace treaty, allowing the Red Line to have the Revolution Square and the Arbat allowed to have Lenin's library. For the Hansa, they would allow all of the factions to travel through their territory as they received the best deal from this, allowing them to secure all of the entire central ring of stations and dominate the majority of Metro's caravans trade. Whilst the Red Line was split in half and the Arbat had lost all of its influence in the northwest area of the Metro. With this bloody war coming to an end, it became clear to many that humanity was still up to its old antics and nothing had changed. War was still a way to control others, and despite there being a peace treaty, it was only a matter of time before another faction wanted something for themselves and started attacking someone else. But for now, the 2010s had come to an end, and the world was once again in a very different place. It was now time for the turn of the decade and the start of the 2020s. As the turn of the decade came about, many events of what happened here are still unknown. It is believed that out there somewhere within D6, soldiers who were once part of the Central Metro Command were working alongside a group of extremely intelligent scientists on their latest invention, used to help them in their future endeavours. Here they would have access to a new combat simulator that would pit them against a wide variety of threats with all the weapons they could dream of. One captain during this time would enter the simulation and would be told to fight their way up the tower within it, fighting through all of the enemies created there. Sadly for these scientists within D6, power fluctuations seem to be happening on a regular basis, and despite all of the tests of the simulator, D6 eventually was completely sealed, trapping everyone inside of it, most likely killing them completely. What caused this shutdown isn't exactly known, however due to the frequent unknown power fluctuations, it could have been due to that. Things weren't getting easier for the mini stations all over the metro however, as more and more mutant attacks were rearing their heads, killing many citizens all over. This encouraged more people to take up arms and heavily secure their own stations, with many watch parties always waiting in case a mutant invasion was imminent. On top of that, more and more mutants were forming up on the surface, with demons taken to the skies and other creatures taking over buildings, making it harder for the stalkers venturing up on the surface to collect the resources they needed. To possibly combat this, but also to enhance their trade skills, three stations of VDNKH, Alexeyevskaya and Rizhskaya all formed into the VDNKH Commonwealth in the late 2020s, which would allow them to empower the line's mushroom tea industry to prevent annexation from the Hansa. This Commonwealth would allow the citizens to have free travel between each of these stations, but the only thing required is for them to have their own passports, which would go on to be issued after this formation. The idea of freedom of movement between these stations was a big thing for all of the citizens, as it just opened their world up a little bit more and brought new things into their life. However, this did come with some limitations as more law enforcement were added to each station and harsh punishment was handed out if you did not follow the rules. On top of that, the citizens were all assigned labour duties to help out where necessary, with the men from VDNKH having to take armed watch in the tunnels leading up to it, as well as the northern tunnel heading to the botanical gardens. Whilst it was a much stricter life for the citizens within the Commonwealth, it brought about 
far more protection for them and allow them to all thrive thanks to their now ever-growing mushroom tea industry that was providing them with a lot of wealth and kept them free from being reliant on the Hansa and their own trade services. Whilst that was being set up, other stations within the 2020s did not have it so easy. For one station, a deadly plague reared its ugly head and infected its first ever citizen, making them patient zero. This plague's origin would be completely unknown and whilst this patient was the first, luckily it did not spread further until the year of 2032, where it would cause outright panic to anyone who was met with it. But during the 2020s was when the first reported person was hit with this plague. Stories also started spreading at this point about the station of Kievskaya, where the Cult of the Worm would be located. Some rangers during this time would find the station and tell stories about how it would be destroyed due to an explosion in the tunnels, and because of that, had buried people alive. They would also go on to tell the story about how the ones who survived within it no longer resemble humans anymore, and that inside there was a mysterious entity that was some kind of fog. Whilst it is known the origin story of the cult of the Great Worm, this was the first time witnesses spoke of their whereabouts and what lurked in the dark of this specific station that was believed to be abandoned. With that said, however, many people thought it to be just tales and not true at all. For the Red Line, more problems were happening within their leadership as General Corbett, Maxim Moskvin's right-hand man, had made a plan to get Moskvin to betray and assassinate his own brother to cement him as the true and only leader of the Red Line. Here he would tell Maxim that his brother meant to kill him and take the power from him, and that he was to act first and kill him instead. Maxim, believing these lies, knew he had to take drastic action now and invited his brother over for a talk and a drink, and when he arrived would poison him and kill him then and there. With him now out of the way, Maxim took over power and Corbett became his second in command. But there was a catch. Corbett knew his dirty secret and used this to exploit Maxim and take over control of the Red Line. Realizing what he had done and that he had to keep it secret, Maxim became extremely depressed, turning to drink every chance he could, trying desperately to forget what he had done and get over the guilt of killing his own brother. Out within Polis Hayevskaya, they were suffering from random disappearances when some of their scouts would venture only one kilometer into the tunnel. When reinforcements were sent in to look for them, they would go on to find absolutely nothing. No bodies, no signs of struggle, nothing at all. They were completely gone. One week passed and another scout party was sent into the same tunnel to finish the job the first failed at, and as expected, this scout party also disappeared. This time, only half a kilometer in. This triggered the station to take action going forward as they would set up a security perimeter 300 meters from the station entrance to make sure nothing could get in or take anyone from them. Sandbags, machine guns, and a spotlight were set up here and all the soldiers were prepared for the worst. On top of that, a runner was sent to the nearest station of Bogovea station to make sure they also knew of this strange new danger that they were facing in the northern tunnels and to advise them to also set up in a similar way. As the Council of Bogovea Station considered this cry for help, they would then receive yet another runner who was more shocked than the first, who stated that their entire security cordon had been killed in silence, almost as if they had been butchered in their sleep. Taking immediate action, the Council sent forward their most experienced army vets to see what was happening and take out the threat. Around 100 men were sent on this task, but when they reached the neighboring station, it was completely empty. There were no no corpses, no sign of light, only tons of blood all over the walls floor and everything they could see. The soldiers were horrified and could not work out what had caused this at all. There was only one option and that was to completely destroy the tunnel leading to that now abandoned station. As the soldiers did so, 40 meters of the tunnel collapsed and the rest of that line was an abandoned dead zone that no one was to venture into. Still to this day it is unknown what happened within that station and where the bodies went. However within Rija, one beggar would go on to tell another story and claim that the the people in the station had all gone mad and killed each other after a tunnel collapse. With more and more people becoming panicked by these rise in mutant attacks and now random disappearances within late 2020s, when the turn of the decade came and humanity entered the 2030s, life was getting much more difficult and their biggest test would be right around the corner. Something that was all caused by a small six-year-old boy when he traveled to the botanical gardens 
surface and left open that extremely important hermetic door leading to the surface. By 2033, every station seemed to be aware that mutant attacks were getting worse, and for the people of the VDNKH area, thanks to that botanical garden door being opened and left open by Artyom, this was at the worst it had ever been, and had even let in the beings of the Dark Ones. More and more disappearances were happening during this time as well, and the command were looking for a solution to these problems to make sure their citizens were safe. At this time, Artyom and his uncle went to greet an old friend, a Spartan ranger named Hunter who had returned to the station on his resource run. But after once again defending from the mutant attacks near their station door, Alex would reveal that the terrifying creatures known as the Dark Ones were behind the disappearances and were rumoured to be the biggest threat they had ever faced, with even Archam's uncle claiming they were the next stage in human evolution. Hunter took action quickly here, stating he needed to make contact with Polis about what was happening within their station, and then he would return. However, would hand Archam his ranger dog tags and tell him if he didn't return, it was up to him to get the message out there. As the day passed, Hunter was nowhere to be seen, and Archam knew it was down to him. He had to make that long journey to Polis to come up with a solution to in the Dark One's threat once and for all. Speaking to his uncle, he would set off on his travels utilizing any form of transport he could and making contact with any friendly face possible, such as the crazed individual of Bourbon, who would take him up to the terrifying surface to get to the next station. For eight full days, Archim ventured to Polis on his mission to tell the Spartan command about the threat and on his way would encounter many of the ghostly apparitions as well as the factions mentioned, such as the Reichs, the Reds, and the many bandits that lingered within the tunnels and old stations, being captured and fired upon many times on his travels by them. During this, he would encounter one area of whole station and witness the horrors that had taken place there. Thanks to the relentless attacks from the Nosilises and Lurkers that had emerged from the dark side of the metro, the station was completely overrun, only leaving behind a few defenders on the outside of the station's doors, who Artyom would aid in their fight back against the mutants. Heading into the actual station itself, Self, Archon would witness the utter destruction caused by these mutants. Bodies littered the land, homes were abandoned and covered in blood, and mutant holes and nests were everywhere. However, during this he would go on to find one small child survivor hiding away from the mutants, a young boy named Sasha, who was next to his uncle's corpse. Eventually fighting off the mutants, Artyom and Sasha would find his mother, as well as some of the other survivors who had managed to escape their station and reunite them once more. It was a real realization moment for Archim as he could finally see why this mission was so important. The Metro needed saving or many, many lives would be lost, like they had within the whole station massacre. The Reichs during this time, however, saw this as an opportunity to make the Metro a better place for them and expand their territory as they would start fighting within the Kite Gorod station, aka Chinatown, as well as any other areas in the nearby vicinity. During this, they would make their first encounter with the Red Line forces and small firefights started to take place between the two factions. The two had known of each other's presence before this, but up until now, tension wasn't that high. After more of these small conflicts took place, eventually full-scale warfare kicked off as the Red Line Fourth Reich War started. During the year of 2033, as Artyom traveled to Polis, the two armies would be a part of a major battle that shaped the war for years to come. This was the Battle of the Bridge. This battle was very similar to what had happened within the Hansa Red Line War, as both both parties found themselves at a stalemate, just looking at each other from either side of the bridge, constantly sending over troops in the hope that maybe one will break through and take the bridge for themselves. This fighting went on for months as more and more inexperienced and poorly equipped red troops were sent over the bridge to try and capture the Reich's land, but would be cut down heavily by the machine guns housed there. This whole battle became infamous amongst the soldiers from both sides, with it being labelled as simply bridge due to the amount of extreme violence and casualties, and one red soldier describing it as attack, counterattack, attack again with no end in sight. Over within Novosibirsk around this time, their situation was getting pretty dire as well, as their whole metro was powered by hydro 
electricity, which the citizens would harvest from the now flooded stations. However, over the many years they had been located there, a horrific mutated slime was taken over those flooded stations, clogging the pumps and waterways, making the water extremely dangerous and toxic. And also following that, a species of giant worm had infested the area, attacking anyone who threatened their existence. This would cause massive power problems for the stations housed there and would force Oscom into taking action to clear out their areas. Troops were assembled with one simple task and that was to cleanse the area to bring the power back and to make it safe once again. Equipping them all with flamethrowers, these troops would have to do this on a regular basis to keep things activated as the slime spread extremely quickly. This became routine, but it was just the start of their problems that were to come around the corner in the next couple of years. Heading back to the Moscow Metro, Artyom would finally find himself within Polis and would speak to Colonel Miller, the leader of the Spartan Rangers, showing him Hunter's dog tags and telling him about the Dark One situation. Taking it to the Polis Council, however, they would ignore the cry for help, forcing the Spartans to take actions upon themselves. Here they would venture up onto the surface to look for a way to kill the Dark Ones, heading to the Lenin Library to search for the book known as The Future. But whilst unsuccessful there, they would eventually find the plans for the mythical bunker of D6, in which they could acquire weapons capable of taking the Dark Ones out. Heading to D6, they would eventually find it with a few rangers dying in the process. Just before that, however, Artyom would go on to discover that at the station of Kievskaya, located near T6, a young boy named Oleg had mysteriously been taken in the night. Working alongside the people there, Artyom would go looking for him as well as some of the other children who had gone missing, only to find themselves captured by the Great Worm Cult, who took them back to Park Pobody. Witnessing the horrors of this cult, Artyom would be close to being killed and eaten by the cult, but was luckily rescued by his ranger friends with a few heavily equipped stalkers, and after taking out the cult, would escape into the D6 bunker. But problems wouldn't stop there as the team would go on to witness the horrors that had been growing in the depths below, a giant biomass creature that had absorbed every living thing around it, something that was a part of a horrific failed experiment, left to grow over the many years. Tragically, Oleg, as well as an unnamed stalker, would die to this biomass monster just before Archon was able to take it out for good, allowing the rangers to explore the bunker without worry anymore. Now with D6 under their role, the rangers would go on to find the targeting module for their missiles, exactly what they needed to take out the Dark One's home on the surface, and stop the danger once and for all. And with that, travelled towards the Ostenkino Tower, protecting Artyom as he ventured to the top and set up everything to end the war. The Dark Ones tried everything to stop Artyom from taking them out, but he overcame their plans and launched the missiles, wiping them out for good. The war with the Dark Ones was over and the Metro was safe from them. But for Archim, this did not sit right with him. Something felt wrong. There was a darkness passing over him suddenly and a massive wave of guilt hit him, as if what he had just done was the worst thing imaginable. He also had a strange feeling that just before he launched, he heard a radio signal. A signal coming from outside of Moscow. But he pushed it to the side for now, as he could not get over what had just happened. His guilt was overwhelming him and Somehow he had to just get back on with his life now that the supposed war with the Dark Ones of 2033 had come to a conclusion, according to many of the Rangers, anyway. In 2034, Artyom wasn't the only one deeply affected by the events of the bombing of the Dark Ones. Hunter, his once mentor, also became heavily changed because of what had taken place. According to him, the battle completely broke him and showed who he truly was as a man. He was extremely violent, he was hate-filled, and this is how he had always been as a human. The sole fact that he joined the Rangers was to fulfill that bloodlust, and it worked. He loved every second of killing and hurting others. This revelation was only enhanced when he discovered the Dark Ones, and now his true image was on show to everyone. It had reawakened the evil inside him that started to devour him instead of curing him. With this new persona on show, Hunter would go on to leave the Rangers for good and ran away making sure he avoided all contact with them as he was somewhat fearful that he would harm the ones he used to call his friends. Now being massively affected by this new persona, Hunter would start to harm himself as a form of 
himself punishment, hating what he had become. Moving to the station of Sevastopolskaya, Hunter would set up a new life here and took on the post of brigadier and there he lived. Not saying much at this point and being extremely scarred from all of the self-punishment he had given himself. This all changed one day when an unknown threat started to attack his home station. Knowing full well of his abilities, Hunter took it upon himself to be the one to fix the situation and went on to assemble a small team consisted of him and two others named Homer and Ahmed. Sadly for Ahmed, he would not last long in the mission as he would be slain at Naganea Station by a hideous mutant. But Hunter did not mourn. He would continue on dragging Homer along with him as they both arrived at Tolskaya Station to discover that all the caravans housed there were being detained due to a mysterious sickness that was a combination of the plague and a new form of rabies. Knowing he had no other option, Hunter had to seek out the help from his once comrades of the rangers within Polis to acquire flamethrowers to sanitize the entire station. During all of this, Homer is dragged along to help Hunter on his mission, with him believing Homer is the key to his lost sanity as he reminds him of a part of himself he lost during his encounter with the Dark Ones. Eventually, after being apart and witnessing the inundation of Tolska Station taken out by the rangers, Hunter decided it was time to return back to his home station to continue living on once again like he did before. During his travels, however, Hunter did develop feelings for a young girl named Sasha, and throughout his journey, the once cold-hearted killer that he had become developed into someone who was far more human, who seemed to care for this companion and could not live without her. This was all shown at the end of his adventure when Sasha becomes extremely injured in the battle and is close to dying, where Hunter cries that she cannot go, he needs her. Also gone on to explain that he had begun experiencing comparable sentiments of love towards his female companion, as he would actively do everything to save her life, twice in fact. But there was no place for them to be together, even if she admired him. Sasha wanted to save the people affected by the plague, but she was too late to help them and was caught up in the assault of the station becoming trapped underneath the many bodies lying there, making many believe that she was dead as well. Hunter would be hurt by these events but continued on taking up his post as brigadier within his home station. Many people believed Hunter to be dead or missing over the years, but really he just wanted to live away from the life he used to have and was happy to accept the man he had truly become or had always been. After the bombing took place at the Ostenkino Tower, Artyom was praised as the hero of the hour. He was the saviour of the metro when he returned home, and for the Spartan Rangers, they saw it fit to welcome him as a member of their order, promoting him to Ranger. The Rangers were also in their element at this time, as they had fully set up all of their operations within the now operational D6 bunker, fully recruiting new members, stockpiling the best weapons, a working canteen, and many other luxuries many had never experienced before. Four. For a time, all looked like it was going perfectly for the Rangers. However, one day, one of their members suddenly disappeared, taking with him a sample of a deadly virus bioweapon that was housed there. This member would be Lidznitsky, who would be secretly a member of the Red Line, working undercover to see what D6 was all about and to find a way to make the Metro fall for good. This wasn't the only thing, however. The Spartans were still keeping an eye out on what was going on with the Red Line Fourth Reich War, and whilst planning their movements to deal with it or at least defend from any attacks, a man that worked closely with Artyom in his journey in 2033 and a loyal ally to the Rangers, Khan, revealed some important news that there was one remaining Dark One left on the surface that he had seen at the Botanical Gardens. Artyom, still not sure on how he felt about the bombing of the Dark Ones, was sent to take it out with the assistance of Colonel Miller's daughter, Anna. Not being able to say no, Artyom chased down the baby Dark One but in the process was forced unconscious by it and captured by the Fourth Reich. After seeing the horrors they were up to in their concentration camps, Artyom was saved by a red line prisoner and escaped the area getting back to a safe spot, but without a moment's rest would be betrayed by what he thought was his friend Major Pavel, who would bring him to the red line's main base of operations to try and extract all the information out of Artyom about D6 and what it houses. After being tortured by the red line, Moskvin's own son gained a heart and objected 
adapted to his father's ways, releasing Artyom who fled the station for good. However, on his escape, learnt about who was really in charge of the Reds, as well as their true goals within the Metro, and how they had a super bioweapon that could finish the job. With this information, Artyom had to warn his rangers about what was going on. Finally getting out of the Metro, Artyom made contact with his Spartans once again, and regrouped at the Sparta base. But once again, this did not last long, as Lesnitsky showed up with his Red Army, and blew up the base, killing many of the rangers in the process, and capturing Anna once again. With Lesnitsky wiping out many of the rangers, he would then go onto the station of Oktyabrskaya to test the virus bioweapon on the residents to see how effective it was. To the Red's amazement, the virus worked extremely well, and the following day after the results, the Reds went back into the area and started burning it all down. The same time that Artyom turned up as well. Eventually, the Reds evacuated the area and the surviving residents of the area were put into quarantine to make sure the virus did not spread any further. For both Artyom and Anna, they were both affected by this virus and were placed in quarantine together, simply due to the fact that they were both found together at the same time. After finally coming out of quarantine, Artyom went on to find the baby dark one with the help of Khan once again. And when saving it from the circus train, Artyom would go into the mind of the creature and his past would be revealed about what had happened on that day when he ventured into the botanical gardens. The baby dark one and Artyom now realized they had a special bond and together they could reveal what the Reds were truly up to and warn all that were heading to the Polis Peace Conference about how they were planning to unleash the virus on all of the Metro. On their travel there, Artyom would go on to encounter both Ledzitsky and Pavel and deal with them once and for all. And soon after all of this was done, Khan, Artyom and the baby dark one would find Colonel Miller and discover through a vision that within D6, more Dark Ones existed and needed being released to allow their species to live on and grow once again. But before they could do that, Artyom and the Baby Dark One needed to stop the Reds from unleashing their plan and taking over D6. Together with the help of Khan and skeptical Miller, they would reveal to everyone what Moskvin had done to his brother and how he had murdered him to seize control. Now with everyone knowing his secret, he would go on to reveal the true plans of the Reds and how Corbett wanted to invade D6 and take it for themselves, forcing everyone to take sudden action and get ready for the last big battle between the Reds and the Rangers for the bunker. At this same time, the Reds and the Reich were still fighting it out on all of their front lines, with heavy troopers of the Reichs holding off the mass quantity of Red troops fighting through to break their line, and Red Line snipers trying to take out heavily guarded Reich outposts on the surface under the cover of a massive radioactive storm. The war was at the most brutal it had ever been, similar in brutality to the Battle of the Bridge, but for the Rangers, it was just beginning. As the Rangers prepared their defences, the Reds hit them more and more with endless waves of their best troops and machinery, including tanks. But the Rangers stood their ground and looked like they were pushing them back. However, one of the Reds' most armoured trains ploughed into D6, knocking out all of the defending Rangers, meaning they were done. The Reds were victorious. Going up to an extremely injured Miller and Artyom, Cormac looked pleased that he was victorious over the best of the best soldiers. However, little did he know that Miller had planned to blow up all of D6 if they were to lose the battle. Before Artyom could detonate the bomb, the baby Dark One showed up with his Dark One family and helped save the Rangers from their inevitable fate, pushing back the Reds without them even knowing what truly happened. After that, the battle for D6 was over, and the Rangers, thanks to the Dark One's intervention, had won, but with D6 being turned into rubble. For the Dark Ones though, they felt unwelcomed by humanity despite what they had done for them. Now was not the time for them to play a part in their rebuilding process, but maybe one day it will be time and they would return once again. As the Dark Ones ventured off into the sunset, a new chapter had been closed, and for Archim and the Spartan Rangers, it was a chance to rebuild what they had lost within D6 and look for new opportunities that might arise out there in the wider world.
Over in Nova Sibiris, things were getting worse by the day. Due to how high up to the surface the metro stations were and how high the radiation was because of the Cobat bomb, the residents had to regularly use the green stuff to survive. The problem was the production of green stuff had stopped back when the war started and now 20 years on, it was quickly running out. The OSCOM command started to look at new plans for what to do if the day were to come and immediately started sending out stalkers to look for a new place to live, to hunt down maps for areas of the country that would be green and livable. If they were to find a place, they would look at evacuating everyone from the metro, get them on a train and escape the city. However, this was a lie. The truth was that there was not enough green stuff to do a full evacuation and realistically many would have to be left behind. That would be decided by the generals at the top. Because of the green stuff running out, the metro turned into a police state where select rations were being handed out to people on a weekly basis. And if you were found in possession of green stuff outside of your allowance, you would be arrested and on some occasions sentenced to death. This new rule of the OSCOM did not sit right with people once again and tensions started brewing between the guards and the citizens, eventually leading to mass riots that saw the deaths of many people from both sides. In the final battle between the OSCOM forces and the rioters, Colonel Slava was sent in to make the difference. But before he could fight back the rioters, he would be betrayed by his own generals who pumped the whole of the metro with poisonous gas, killing everyone in its way. It was here where Colonel Slava realized that this plan was all a divergence to save the higher up members and evacuate them to safety, leaving behind everyone else to just simply die. Colonel Slava realized even his own general, Tolia, had been betrayed as well, as he desperately attempted to stop the train evacuating the area by getting his soldiers to destroy it for good. As the general was killed in the end, silence fell on the metro station with only two remaining survivors out of the many that once lived there. Those included Colonel Slava and his son Kirill. By mid-2035, Slava knew he could not just sit there and live with his son in the hope that things would get better. He needed to find that green land the generals were so adamant was out there somewhere. Leaving his son within the metro in safety, Slava travelled deep into the city and eventually found the green map. But it was too late. He had been out in the radiation for too long and was heavily irradiated and very quickly was dying. In the last attempt to save himself, he would grab his green stuff meds and try to administer it only for a blind one to knock it out of his hands and break it, making it utterly useless. With nothing else to do, Slava grabbed the map of the green area and took a seat and tragically passed away. Sadly for Slava, he was so close to saving him and his son, but the utterly unforgiving city was too much for him and now Kirill was alone hoping that someone out there was coming to save him. If not, Novosibirsk would truly become a dead city with all of its residents being killed and left to rot in the once thriving community. the time 2035 came around, Artyom had started thinking back to the time he was up on the top of Ostenkino Tower before he launched the missiles and thought back to the signal he was sure he had heard coming from outside of Moscow itself. For a time he would just ignore it and just try to enjoy life with his new wife Anna living within his old station of VDNKH exhibition after having left the order for good. Over on the Reich's side things were changing after what was a horrible period for their faction and after the ceasefire during 2034. This time time the Reich changed their overall appearance and messaging, trying desperately to appeal to new members, as well as encouraging that those past members that they were more welcoming and accepting than before. The Red Line, however, would find themselves within a horrific situation where they would be struck by an epidemic that was rendering all of their mushrooms inedible, pushing them into the largest famine ever seen, with many of their citizens dying out. For the Rangers, so many of their members had been lost in the Battle of D6, and a new recruitment process process went ahead, with many members of the Hansa becoming a part of their ranks just to bolster their numbers. Despite having everything he wanted, Artyom could not shake the idea that maybe the world had not ended during the events of World War III and the signal he heard was life outside of Moscow. He had to chase it down and find out if he was right or not. But this new worldview annoyed and scared a lot of people, including Anna, who just wanted to settle down and have children with him. Artyom would ignore this however and on a day 
daily basis would travel up to the surface to search for the signal he thought he heard that day back in 2033. But this constant journey to the surface had turned him from once that brave hero to a complete madman who was risking his life and bringing back tons of radiation into the metro to search for a signal that didn't in their eyes exist at all. Eventually Artyom was in luck as he bumped into an old man, Homer, who told him of a radio operator he met within the station named Umbach, who claimed to have been in contact with survivors from Polar Dawns in Northern Russia. In exchange for this, Artyom would have to help Homer with his book on his experience with the Dark Ones. On their journey, the two would find themselves within the Reich stations and suddenly forced by a Nazi officer to help them place explosives in nearby theatre station that they needed for their upcoming attack on the Reds. During this, Artyom would go on to learn that the man he was looking for had been captured by the Reds and taken to another station under the suspicion that he was a saboteur. After leaving theatre station, Artyom was able to find the man, but before he could talk to him, a Red officer would go on to shoot Umba, killing him instantly. Moments later, the bomb Artyom had placed detonated and the right began their attack on the Reds, landing Artyom right in the middle of it. Desperate to escape, Artyom would venture to the surface without a gas mask and protective suit, and with a lot of effort aimed to get to Polis to tell Miller of what was going on. Luckily, Artyom made it and found that Miller would be sending a missive to the Fuhrer to stop the new conflict between the Reds and the Reich, but at the same time told Artyom that his exposure to the Dark Ones had driven him completely mad and that he needs to leave his daughter Anna for good as he is a bad influence on her with the wrong goal in life. Leaving Polis with the message for the Fuhrer, Artyom would meet up with the Nazi soldier who had helped him beforehand and handed him the letter from Miller, but the soldier was not accepting this and captured Artyom and kept him with all of the other slaves within the area. Days passed as Artyom would be starved and abused living in horrific conditions and suddenly a group of Nazi soldiers entered the station in a panic, clearly showing that their war was not going well. Their new order was to blow up the tunnel connecting the two stations, but the soldiers had a fear that the Reds would attack before that and rounded up all of the prisoners to fight on their behalf. All of them, including Artyom, were sent into the tunnel with melee weapons such as pickaxes and hammers and were left to fight the Reds in a pitch black tunnel. The battle ended with many dead in the process, but as Artyom got up after being injured, he would discover the barbaric nature of this battle. These were not Red soldiers, these were also prisoners who were being forced to fight by their captors. This battle was truly a PvP situation. Prisoners versus prisoners. Speaking to the surviving prisoners, Artyom would go on to discover one who claimed she had also met survivors from outside of Moscow, only highlighting that Artyom was indeed right all along and he had to follow this up. After escaping once again and going up to the surface, discovering the mass graves of multiple red line workers, Artyom would find a building with a console and after smashing it in a rage, it would happen. Multiple signals came through from different areas of the world, Paris, Berlin, Vladivostok and many more. It became clear to Artyom the signals were real. They were just being blocked by towers made by someone, but who? But this brought about unwanted attention for Artyom as he was threatened by one of his old ranger friends, stating that he needed needed to stop destroying the signal blocks or he wouldn't be able to stop the grey uniformed men from attacking. This ranger would also go on to say that NATO was still attacking. They were still at war and the jamming towers were to keep Moscow hidden from the rest of the world. As Artyom was brought to Polis by his ranger friend, Miller would apologise for not believing Artyom and said he had to keep the truth of other cities secret, otherwise the people would have rioted against them and started trying to find loved ones all over the country. With this, Miller offered Artyom his rollback within the Rangers, which he would accept and would be sent out on a new mission to send 20,000 bullets to the Hansa. During this mission, however, Artyom would realize that the Hansa troops weren't Hansa at all. In fact, they were Reds and immediately on this realization, the two unnamed Rangers he was with would grab him and state that Miller was ordered to kill him if he found out the truth of where the bullets were going. Saved by his Ranger friend, Artyom would flee from the Reds area, passing through all of the starving citizens, massively affected by the famine and would eventually make it to Trubnaya station, avoiding all of the Hansa troops sent by Miller to kill them. Here they would also go on to witness the mass load of Reich refugees who had lost all of their stations due to the tunnel being blown up in their battle, completely flooding everywhere in their area, with the Fuhrer even going missing. During all of these events, Artyom had also been accompanied by Homer, who had discovered that Sasha, the girl who they believed was dead in 2034, was still alive and was now working as a 
prostitute for her pimp, a man named Bezolov. Artyom, furious at the situation, tried to kill him, but suddenly he was rendered unconscious from his overwhelming radiation poisoning that had not been treated. Waking up in a clean room with empty beds and an IV drip in his arm, it was revealed that a full week had passed and now he was fully healed. But Artyom did not want to stay around as he broke out of the hospital bed before coming face to face with Bezolov again, the man he had met on multiple occasions now. It was here where Bezolov would reveal what was really going on. This Soviet era bunker he was in now was where the invisible watchers lived. They weren't legendary figures, they were real. They were the remnants of the Russian government who were in control of all of the four major factions of the Metro, the Reich, the Hansa, the Reds and Polis. Knowing that Artyom was dangerous, Bezolov requested that he join his group and work for him, but Artyom refused and left immediately to get back to Polis, but once again was arrested and put in a jail cell with Homer and his ranger friends who went against the order. As the trial went ahead, the truth about Miller is revealed, and outrage amongst the rangers who survived the battle at D6 starts to happen, including one ranger named Stepan. With this, the order starts fighting each other with hand-to-hand -hand combat, with some of the Miller loyal rangers capturing Anna and threatening to kill her if Artyom does not surrender to them, which he then does. Sadly for Artyom, they were unable to capture Bezolov in time, however the chairman of Polis goes on to address the entire station, stating that Moscow is not the only city left and they are still at war. Now was the chance to arm everyone and unite them fully so they can protect themselves from the West when they inevitably find them. Artyom, not trusting anyone around him at this point, flees Polis with Anna and heads back to their home in exhibition. Desperate to get people on his side, Artyom tried to convince everyone to come with them as they are being lied to. However, only Anna believes him and the two are considered crazy by their neighbors and friends. The Hansa quickly get to exhibition trying to find Artyom and Anna and force Sukhoi to turn them over or they would completely blockade the station. But by this point, Artyom and Anna had said their goodbyes to him and would load up a car with food, water, filters and diesel and would drive out east to head to Vladivostok over 9,000 kilometers away, hoping to find answers and a new life where they could set up and start anew. Watching them leave from a distance, Bezolov would be contacted about Artyom leaving for the east, but for Bezolov, he would go on to state that they can go, as they weren't a threat to them anymore. Where this leaves the rest of the metro, no one knows, but for Artyom, he was right all along, and the wide world was theirs for the taking, but who knows what they would discover now and in the future. Sadly breaking the immersion of this video, the events of Metro Exodus tell of a different tale but keep the similar theme. Before that, however, out somewhere within the Volga, Salantius had witnessed a group of travelers venturing into the area coming from the Ural region. Salantius immediately trapped them and ordered the purification, aka the destruction of their rail car, as well as sentencing many of their group to death. One woman in this group named Katya caught the eye of Salantius as he went on to send her husband off to death so he could then claim her as his own wife. Now with Katya and her daughter in his possession, he would go on to lock them in his church's tower to prepare her to be his wife, whether she liked it or not. Katya and her daughter would be looked after, but would constantly look out and hope that either her husband returned or a group of strangers could come and save them. Back in Moscow, as Artyom continued to look for that signal that he heard back in the Ostenkino tower, he and Anna would find that there was indeed life outside of the city as they would not only run into a fully functioning train leaving the city, but also prisoners from outside of Moscow who were being rounded up by Hansa forces and killed in extremely barbaric ways. For Artyom and Anna, it was clear that they were being lied to and they needed to find answers. And when looking for the train, would discover that there were other signals outside of the city but were being blocked by these same soldiers, claiming that once again, they were still at war against the West and NATO, destroying the signal jam Artyom and Anna would discover that life did exist out there all over the world in countries such as America, UK, Germany, South Africa and Australia to name a few. Finally getting to the train, the two would infiltrate it and start taking off into the wider world, but would be taken out by a special force sent to stop them. This special force, however, was Artyom's friends and squadmates from the Rangers, including Anna's own father, Colonel Miller, who would find himself extremely conflicted about what happened and his future. 
After much contemplation, the whole ranger crew would venture out on their journey, seeking the green land Artyom had been dreaming about for months on end. First getting to the Volga, the crew would witness Salantius's technophobic society and how scared they were of the train crew, as well as other oddities, such as the electric anomalies that had terrified the locals for years and the giant catfish-like sarfish that roamed the waters. During their time here though, whilst off exploring, Anna would fall into a bunker used for housing dangerous experimental substances from Novosibirsk and in the process would destroy her gas mask. Artyom would find her just in time but Anna was deeply affected by this as a permanent cough would be visible at all times, getting worse by the day. Eventually the crew left the area of the Volga after solving the Salantius bridge blockade and would receive a signal from what they believed were the government within the Ark. The cannibals caught the bait and Artyom and his crew were in grave danger. Getting to the Ark it was clear that things were wrong as the cannibals came out in their droves capturing Artyom, Anna and Miller, taking Anna off for medical checks. But luckily for Miller and Artyom they would be saved and a huge gunfight took place throughout the bunker. Eventually Artyom would find Anna with the leader of the Ark, the Doctor, and after being saved Anna would kill him but at the same time would be told what was happening within her body. Without the others knowing Anna was slowly dying and she needed a cure soon. Before she told anyone however the crew were now within the Caspian Desert and would witness the brutality of the Baron's rule, capturing and enslaving all of the locals within the area and forcing them to work on his projects. Desperate for information, Artyom would venture below to a pre-war bunker as well as gaining water reserves for their train battling the horrific temperatures and terrifying creatures. After meeting the Baron and dealing with him and his regime, the crew would be able to move on once again, hopefully this time finding some green land in which they could live and rebuild. Miller would go on to tell the crew that there was indeed a green area within Kazakhstan near a hydroelectric power station. This was great news for the crew and on top of that, celebrations were being had due to recent news about Stepan and Katya who were getting married. However, as this celebration went on, Anna would take a turn for the worst as she would go on to cough up blood and almost pass out. After lying down, Anna would reveal what the doctor in the Ark had told her, that her lungs were falling apart due to her fall in the bunker in the Volga. The crew needed to help her and urgently now. This was the priority. Katya would reveal that there was one cure which could work as her village received it during the war. This was an experimental drug however, but it did cure the conditions that Anna housed. For now though, as Katya researched what the drug was and where it was located, Artyom and Alosha were sent on a scouting mission to see if this green land within Taiga was a livable environment in which they could settle in once they cured Anna. Heading into Kazakhstan, Artyom would find himself isolated from everyone as his and Aloysius' train cart fell into the river, to then be saved by a mysterious individual. And then after that, would go on to venture through the forest observing the children of the forest's activities. Sneaking through, he would go on to meet with Olga, the faction member who had saved him from drowning in the first place, who would explain the clan's history to him, as well as explaining the area around her. Eventually, after heading through the pirate areas meeting with their leader, Artyom would encounter his other scout crew member, Aloysia, it would go on to reveal the terrifying problem with this area. It was soon to be filled with deadly radiation and if anyone continued to stay there, they would be wiped out in a few days. Not only that, but Artyom would be faced with another encounter with a huge mutated bear that had been roaming around the area called the Forest Master. Artyom had battled it before, but this was its final stand. And luckily for Artyom, he was victorious and took it out. And together with Aloysia, they would finally head back to the train to escape the area or saying a final goodbye to Olga and her children of the forest. Getting back to the Aurora train, Anna's condition was getting worse by the day. Katya's research had finished, but it was not good news. The drug was named Renegan F, and it was housed within a place called the Institute in Novosibirsk, which was still heavily irradiated and deadly for anyone to venture into. But this was the only way to save Anna, and despite the terrifying risk, Artyom and Miller offered to go into the city, with Miller looking for a map of all of the green areas over the land and Artyom going to find this experimental drug. As they got into the city fully geared with anti-rad equipment, Miller and Artyom would witness the horrors of what had happened within the metro stations just months before they had arrived. They would also go on to meet the last survivor of this city, Colonel Slava's son Kirill, who would show them his safe space, his father's equipment and everything the metro once housed, including the green stuff which Artyom and Miller would use to head to the surface. Now splitting up, 
up, Archeon would head into the dead city, having hallucinations of past events as well as seeing visions of Anna crying for help. And on top of this, silhouettes of what was believed to be Dark Ones. Whether the Dark Ones moved into this city to live away from the humans is unknown, but is very likely. But they weren't the real threat. Instead, Novosibirsk's living experiment known as the Blind Ones would be, as they would roam around the Institute building, getting inside his mind and attacking him if Artyom so much as stepped on a bit of glass. Eventually, Artyom would find the experimental drug and would start heading back to the train, but the blind one found him and attempted to rip him apart, but luckily for Artyom, he would go on to kill it, but at a cost. He had no more green stuff and was left out in the open, getting hit with a ton of radiation. It looked like the end for Artyom as he gradually started losing consciousness, but luckily for him, Miller after locating the Greenland map where Colonel Slava had died, found himself being guided to Artyom's location and would save him. Picking up Kirill, the three headed back. However, Miller sacrificed himself to save Artyom, at least long enough for him to get back to the train. Miller, by the time the Aurora arrived, had passed on, being overwhelmed by the radiation of the dead city, and his sacrifice would be remembered by all. With the experiment drug now being administered to Anna, she had been saved, but now it was the the crew's turn to save Artyom, who had been heavily irradiated and needed blood transfusions to be saved. After witnessing people of his past, Artyom would also have a vision of Miller telling him to move forward with his life and enjoy life in the new green lands they now know of. And after that, Artyom was saved and their long journey to seek new land was over. Now at this green lands, the crew would go on to hold a funeral for Colonel Miller, honoring him for all he had done for them over the years. And with that, their chapter would was over for now. For Lance Corporal Samuel Sam Taylor, he was deeply affected by Colonel Miller's death after being by his loyal side for many years since the metros were first lived in. Seeing Miller die reminded him of his home back in California and more specifically his father. He wondered if the world did have people out there, maybe somehow his father had survived it and maybe if he could find a way back, he could be acquainted with him once again. Thinking about this, Sam grabbed the truck said goodbye to the crew and headed over to Vladivostok, a shipping city in the hope that when there, he could find a boat to head back to his country. Getting to Vladivostok, Sam would witness a power struggle between a man named Tom and his army, bandits, and the captain of the nuclear submarine housed there. Hearing all sides of their stories, Sam would go on a mission to locate the power cells hidden by the captain to power up to the nuclear submarine once again. However, as they all got back, Tom's right-hand man, Klim, would go on to betray him and started yet another power struggle with Sam having to shut him down. Eventually, after a long, grueling battle, Sam was faced with the decision. Did he side with Tom and get that lift back to the US to see his father, or did he destroy the submarine to make sure no one could use its nuclear capabilities and cause more destruction on the land? The decision is unknown. However, heading into 2036, it is more than likely that despite that horrible idea that a nuclear submarine roams the world and could destroy more land, Sam did indeed return to American soil and would go out on a journey to seek out his father as well as witness what the land of America had turned into now, 13 years after the Great War of 2013. For Artyom and his crew, however, the people of the Moscow are still trapped, being ruled by the deadly invisible watchers. To Fully rebuild, he would need more people, so maybe he and his crew can venture back in the Aurora to tell everyone about their land and try to save people from their oppressive rule. But that's easier said than done, as all of them are now traitors and will be shot on sight. But maybe with the help of the Dark Ones once again, they could win the war against the Invisible Watchers and finally welcome more into the Green Land to create a new world. A world where Dark Ones and humans could live together and rebuild into a new bright future. Who knows what will happen next, but it's exciting to think about what could come in the future of this universe. But for now, this has been the full story and series of events from the post-apocalyptic universe of Metro. I want to say
say a big thank you for watching this timeline. It's been a video I've been working on for some time now, and it's great to finally get it made for you guys. If you did enjoy it and want more Metro Law videos, I have a playlist in the description below that has all of them. And let me know any other videos you'd want to see from this game. Also, a like, comment, and subscribe would really help this channel out and is very much appreciated. I also want to say a huge, huge thank you to my patrons for allowing me to make videos like this, including my small fish, my big fishes, Anthony, Arto Krem, Christopher, Greg, and Last Persona user, my YouTube channel Wise Ones, Video Game Player 75, Ico the Wolf, A Frosty Vodka, Tomb of Ash, Sith Lord 906, and Fiery Italian, my sharks, Jason X117, and Wow Such Gaming, and my Megalodons, Chernobyl Stalker, Hazy Thoughts, Rhoda C, and Sinus. If you want to support this channel further, you can buy some merch or visit the links in the description below. But honestly, your time is all I can ask for. Thank you all for watching once again, and I shall see you all in the next one. Spasibo.